Well, this is Germany, so we have to start on time. I'll give the floor for a few minutes to Michael Janning. He is a vice president of SAP, a major sponsor of this forum, and his master thesis was in algebra. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. As I said, as a mathematician myself, I'm more than happy and proud to welcome you here at, at the SAP buildings for your last day of the Laureate Forum. So, very warm welcome to you. And um, let me just give you a little anecdote um, of my son who started elementary school to see how important learning and researching is a lifelong, as a, in a lifelong time. So, um, he entered elementary school two years ago, and after the very first week on a Friday afternoon, I asked him, um, well, Leonard, how was it today at school? And he said, mm, okay, good. Said, All right, okay. Did you say anything during the lesson? Did you contribute? Did you say, mm, no, nothing? I said, oh, come on, nothing, really? I mean, you're supposed to work there, and I want you to contribute to the lessons and, and say something. Said, no, I didn't do anything. I said, oh, come on, we have to change that. And then he said, oh, yeah, I said one thing. I said, oh, what was it? When will we be finished? <laughs> <laughs> So I had to explain to him that learning takes a lifelong, it never stops. And learning and researching is important, also important for SAP. We need to find new innovations, new topics, and this is why we are here, why you are here. And so I'm very happy to open this um, last day of your Laureate Forum here at the SAP buildings. And we as a sponsor are proud to see you all here. So thank you very much and have a great day. Enjoy the time. Thank you. Thanks. Well, we proceed with the program. Uh, the first speaker is Raj Reddy. Uh, Professor Reddy was born in India and uh, he studied at the University of Madras, uh, University of South Wales and Stanford. He started as a young assistant professor at Stanford, then moved to Carnegie Mellon, and he is the person who changes scientific landscape. Uh, he founded the Institute of Robotics at Carnegie Mellon and half a dozen of other institutes, and he founded a university in India. He was a co-chair of the Presidential Council on Information Technology when presidents were still interested in it. <laughs> Please, Professor Reddy. And I, I won't speak about his science. He will speak about it. But my impression is that uh, the speech recognition that we all enjoy at this forum is essentially based on his ideas. Thank you. Good morning. I want to thank uh, Laureates, Heidelberg Laureates Forum for giving us this opportunity to spend a whole week with distinguished laureates and brilliant young minds all in one place. It's amazing to be uh, with all of you for this whole week. And I thought I'll share with you a set of uh, grand challenges of AI that may in fact be the problems you will end up solving. It may take you 10, 20, 30 years, but it's the kind of thing uh, that has to start somewhere. The title of my talk is The Unfinished Agenda of Grand Challenges. Uh, the unfinished comes from the fact I presented 30 years ago a list of grand challenges in AI when I was giving the presidential address at the American Association for Artificial Intelligence. And some of those problems were amazingly solved and others are not yet solved. And so what I thought I'd like to do is kind of give you a broad um, perspective on what grand challenges are and ha have been, and then talk about uh, some of the grand challenges in AI that have been 
solved and the history of how we got there, how they got solved. And then end the last part of the talk with giving you a new list, a revised list of grand challenges uh, that might keep us busy in the 21st century. Okay. So a grand challenge is a difficult to accomplish goal-directed research effort with distinct metrics. And uh, I think it's uh, the goal-directed is probably the most important part. In, in research, we have curiosity-driven research and goal-driven research. And a lot of the research in basic research is curiosity-driven. But there's also a lot of basic research in goal-driven research. It's called the Pasteur's Quadrant. And there's a book by that name, but I won't go into that. Grand Challenges is a way of focusing one's attention on a specific problem which, when solved, would have a major benefit or impact on society. And it, they encourage people to think out of the box. Unlike conventional grants and contracts, which are awarded in the hope that the recipient will be successful, uh, the uh, grand challenges uh, set up uh, ambitious goals and reward the winning entry. It allows multiple approaches without knowing which is most likely to succeed. Grand challenges also encourage broad participation because anyone can join. Anyone can say, I'm going to work on this problem. And the economics are also great. The actually solving some of these problems may cost 10, 100 times more money than the price is. And so together, it represents a very interesting direct, interesting way to do new research. And more and more people like uh, DARPA, XPRIZE Foundation, uh, Gates, Hillman, uh, Gates um, Foundation, all of them are beginning to use this approach for solving their problems. There's a long history of grand challenges. Uh, the most famous one is uh, in 1714, the British government actually passed a law called the Longitude Act, which offered, uh, I think at that time, 10,000 uh, pounds uh, for the, um, uh, the first person to come up with a solution for finding the longitude. And um, as it was known already, longitude can be found if you had a precise idea of what, what the time is at that point in time. So the, uh, the equivalent was to build a chronometer which was accurate to uh, not minutes, not seconds, even you know, milliseconds. And um, so the, uh, it, it took 50 years for this prize to be awarded to John Harrison. It actually, he built a series of clocks, H1, H2, H5, and so on. And uh, the first one, they gave him, you know, said, yeah, that's good enough, but not close the, as close as we want. So they gave him some money saying to keep him you know, engaged and said, make it smaller and faster and you know, cheaper and everything. And he built a series of these things and they kept giving him some more money each time. And finally, uh, they gave him the 10,000 pounds, that too with a little bit of litigation. But it's like about 1.5 million pounds today, which is a you know, non-trivial uh, award at that time. The other famous prize is the aviation prize to fly nonstop from New York to Paris. Uh, and the prize was 25,000, which today is 300, 400,000 dollars. And you know, it's still substantial. Uh, Charles Lindbergh won that prize. And uh, so later on, I'll talk about the Ansari X Prize, Space Prize, which is similar. More recently, there have been two major groups that have been uh, using Grand Challenge uh, prize, you know, prize-based announcements. Uh, the first one, there's a whole foundation called X Prize Foundation. If you are not familiar with it. They have sponsored a whole bunch of them. I don't have the time or space to give you all of them. 
I recommend that you go look at it on the, on the web. But uh, there are two or three interesting ones. The first one was the Ansari X Prize uh, for a private spaceship capable of flying three people uh, uh, into space and then come back and land and do that twice in two weeks. Very crisp definition. And, uh, and, the, and the prize was $10 million. And so the number of people were actually competing for it. The group that won it was an aircraft designed by Bert Rutan, who is a very famous uh, aeronautical designer and funded by Paul Allen of Microsoft fame. And um, so it was, a, it was a major accomplishment and it took them from the time of announcement in 1996, about eight years uh, to get there. The, the, the later on in 2007, they announced a different price. I think this was Progressive or someone that provided the funding and to kind of demonstrate a car that would be go for more than 100 miles per gallon and uh, would <coughs> satisfy other constraints like four passenger cars and so on. Then they expanded it to include uh, electric vehicles and also motorcycles and so on. And the motorcycles went 205 miles per gallon. The electric vehicles went 187. So it was a very interesting thing. There is an example where the technology was almost ready and the people knew exactly what to do and the whole thing was won within three years. And uh, there were other prizes that were canceled because by the time the prize was announced, it was already done. This was in the DNA space, which you'll find. I won't get into it. So the most recent one, which is very exciting to me, is this Global Learning X Prize. Basically, they announced if you can if a child in the middle of nowhere, in a village in Africa somewhere, where there's no teacher, no nothing, given a tablet, can they learn to read, write, and do arithmetic at the first, second, third grade levels? No teacher. So this is a very important educational research problem, learning without a teacher. And uh, there have been many attempts with MOOC lectures and so on, where people assumed it would be possible to do that. And these MOOC lectures have been very influential in the last 10 years. But there we're discovering not having a teacher doesn't always work. The reason is most of us are not motivated to learn. If you're motivated to learn, then uh, you, you can just, you, you know, you don't need any teacher, you don't need any classroom and so on. And uh, this is what Harari says in his book on 21st, 21 questions. He says, in the future, you don't need to go to school. You don't need to go to university. You don't need anything because everything you need to know is on the web. And therefore, uh, it, what is it that we should be teaching students in classes and what, what do we do? And, and it's a very interesting set of issues. I recommend you read his book to look at it more, more carefully. Anyway, this $15 million Global X Prize was won by two people, a KitKit school group from South Korea and USA, and one billion group from Kenya. And uh, it's amazing. I have some tablets that I've used, and, uh, and uh, the KitKit school tablet, uh, to motivate the students, they convert the learning into a game. It's like a game playing, you know, people become addictive you know, in, <laughs> to games. And so the idea is the only way you are going to motivate the kids is to convert it into a game. And they have done a great job in do, designing it. Uh, the user interface itself is very interesting because when you turn it on, you don't know what you're supposed to do. And it waits for a minute or so. Even if you do nothing, then a figure pops up and, and jumps up and down. Then you say, maybe I'm supposed to do something. You touch it and then slowly you, know, you begin to uh, see what you have to do. So the idea that you, 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 even, you don't even know how, that you have to turn it on, right? How do you turn it on? How do you turn on the tablet kind of thing? Anyway, there are lots of interesting 
thing. DARPA, um, which was more goal-directed, not necessarily different, this is a different set of objectives for them. DARPA is Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in USA, which has funded most of AI research in, in, in USA for, uh, for the last 50 years, 60 years. Uh, I was a graduate student at Stanford in 1963, and uh, Ivan Sutherland was the one that funded us at MIT, Carnegie Mellon, and Stanford. And uh, so there are a number of grand challenges they have funded. Uh, the most interesting one is the car that drives itself, self-autonomous driverless car. And there are a whole bunch of other ones I won't go through because we have, don't have the time. But the, the slides will be online, so you'll be able to see it. There are two other important set of lists of uh, grand challenges. Unlike the other ones, these don't have a price. And I believe that's one of the problems with these, these, uh, these two lists. Um, because without a motivation, people will say, yeah, that's a good idea. Let somebody else solve it. But if you said ah, there's a $10 million price for the first group that can do it in three years or five years, then all of a sudden people think maybe I can do that, right? So the, uh, the engineering grand challenges from National Academy of Engineering, Royal Academy of Engineering, and Chinese Academy of Engineering are to provide clean water, uh, eliminate nuclear terror, terror uh, engineering of better medicines, and goes on. I won't go through all the list, but uh, the, one of the ones that's interesting, um, probably the, the least likely to happen in this century, is this number eight, reverse engineering the brain. Ray Kurzweil, one of uh, early pioneers of AI, um, has written many books, including Singularity, and he proposes that the way you live forever, immortality, is by reverse engineering the brain, right? And the way you reverse engineer the brain <laughs> is to do one slice at a time and hopefully reconstruct all the cells. Um, and there are 10 to the 11 cells in the brain. So, it, but the, it could be done, but in all these problems, somebody has to work on it and somebody has to fund it. Until that happens, it's not going to happen. So it's not that it's not an uh, unsolvable problem. It's just that it may never happen because nobody else is being funded. So uh, the 14 is advanced personalized learning is the, the, the grand challenge prize we talked about, Global Learning X Prize. So the other very important one is uh, sustainable development goals. If you go to any United Nations meeting anywhere in the world, they will talk, tell you about SDGs. And, and so they have a list of 17 of them. And they are uh, also, to me, they're grand challenges. The problem with them is they're even vaguer than the, the engineering grand challenges. Eliminate poverty. What does that mean? Uh, but it, it turns out, if you're serious, take it seriously, then you can actually define saying, First, find a region and measure the number of people that are in poverty and then come up with a solution and then measure whether you've solved the problem. And, and if you were to kind of make it crisper definition about, about, about poverty, then it may be possible. The question is, how do you measure how many people are in poverty? You know, if you heard Shwetak uh, Patel's talk yesterday, that might give you some ideas about how you might go about measuring how many people are getting three, three meals a day. So it's not impossible, but somebody has to work on it, right? The same is true about health and hunger and well-being and education, gender equality, clean water, and so on. And uh, sanitation, you know, Bill Gates is famous. It was in, in the news uh, last year because he had a test tube full of poop uh, to demonstrate that the, the uh, uh, waterless toilet uh, works perfectly. You know. So anyway, <clears throat> so I, want, I don't want to spend a lot more time on it because my talk is about AI grand challenges. 
So that it turned out, as I said in 1988, I made up a list of about eight or ten grand challenges, uh, of which I was pleasantly surprised three of them have been solved. I'd like to tell, tell you what they are and how they got to be solved because you know these things don't happen overnight. Sometimes it takes 50 years. The first one is um, the world champion chess machine. And uh, in 1960 or 58, Herbert, Herbert Simon, one of the founders of AI, uh, famously announced that we will have a world champion chess machine in 10 years. You know, it, it was, it was clear in my, his mind is a solvable problem. Yeah, but it turned out it took not 10 years, but 40 years. But that's, you know, in, the, in terms of evolution of how long it took us to create AI or intelligence, uh, it, 10 years or 40 years is probably not that indistinguishable, not, not indistinguishable. So, uh, the <clears throat> So the, there's a long history of people building chess machines using computers of different time. And in the 60s, the computers were very slow compared to today. Now we have computers that are a billion times faster. And uh, so at that time, uh, there was a, a Greenblatt at MIT built one of the first uh, chess machines, which actually played in a tournament and uh, beat some novice players, but it was at a kind of the lowest level of um, things. And over a period of time, people at Northwestern and Bell Labs and CMU built a series of systems which reached faster and you know, better and better ratings. And uh, the, the, the one, the last one, the deep thought that was built by four students at CMU uh, reached the grand master level and IBM came and hired the whole team uh, and, and to build Deep Blue which ultimately won the world champion chess machine. So there, there was a, we established a prize in 1979 uh, of $100,000 called the Fredkin Prize which was then awarded to the winning team in 1997. So it was like 18 years after the prize was announced. We didn't know how long it would take and whether anybody would be able to do it at all. And again, if it happened, it's not because we had brilliant ideas in AI, it's purely because the computers became a thousand times or a million times faster in that period of um, uh, 20 years, like 10,000 times faster. And so <clears throat> and we have a, a recording of it, you know, there's a, uh, the, we awarded these prizes uh, the, on the right hand side there, you will see Fredkin, the three people that won the prize are in the middle. And we also did one thing very important at that time. We said they didn't become, somehow magically become the world champions. They, as Newton said, uh, I stood on the shoulders of other people, right? And there are all these other people, we kind of brought all of them together and gave them a medal. And, uh, and these are all different people. You can read the names and you'll be able to see them in the uh, slides. The, the, these, when you do solve such a problem, it is just the beginning, it's not the ending. It turns out since then, there have been a number of advances in game playing uh, and the, <clears throat> the first one, the early checkers was in 1994, chess world champion was 1997, and then uh, more recently in 2015, there was a big news, news items you might have read uh, of playing Go. Go is my, you know, uh, very you know, important challenge because we had a chess is a problem that involves 10 to the 46 certain search elements uh, and when you go to go is much larger 10 to the uh, 140 172 and um, you know 10 to the 120 is the more, more than the number of atoms in all of the universe so the interesting thing is then we have been going to 
games with incomplete information. When you're playing chess, you know exactly what you know, you know exactly what the, your opponent knows, so there's nothing hidden. But there are other games like poker and mahjong, where much more of the information, uh, there's a lot of information that is hidden from you, so you're dealing with incomplete information. And building such programs is much more complicated, takes a lot more time. And so uh, poker, again by Thomas Sandholm, uh, <clears throat> won the uh, championship, Texas No Hands Hold Them Championship in 2017. Uh, more recently, in 2019, uh, in, when I was in China, they claim that they have, uh, they are adva making advances into playing Mahjong, which is, has 10 to the 48 uh, times hidden information, so it's not easy to play that game. So it's very interesting. So th these are kind of continue to, people keep continue to work on these things. And so the next problem uh, that one of the grand challenges that I, that I announced in 88 got, that got solved was accident avoiding cruise control or uh, driverless ch car challenge. This challenge uh, was decided in 25, 2005 when Stanford Stanley headed by Sebastian Thurn and CMU uh, Sandstorm headed by Red Whitaker and five other cars uh, successfully completed the, the, this challenge. Uh, three of these, including Sebastian, was at CMU in the Robotics Institute for 10 years just the year before he went to Stanford. So all of them have CMU DNA. <laughs> so not all of them, but I'd like to show you a video because here we happen to have videos explaining what happened, how we got there. This research has produced results in the areas of perception, planning, and systems for autonomous road following in real world conditions. Two testbed robots, the Terrigator and the Nav Lab, have been equipped with sonars, cameras, and a scanning laser rangefinder. The Nav Lab also carries researchers and computers on board, including a warp supercomputer. By using the warp, we can process an image every two seconds and drive the Nav Lab at one meter per second. Our color vision, 3D perception, recognition and mapping, and road following modules have achieved significant capabilities for navigating roads. These modules also provide a strong basis for our next major emphasis, cross-country navigation. It will require continual fundamental research and advanced development of vision, planning, modeling, and mechanism. The strobe light is on. The command from the tower is to move. Ladies and gentlemen, Sandstorm. Sandstorm was second in the, uh, the, Stanley was number one, but I didn't have a video of that <laughs> from Stanford. But uh, all of them have CMU DNA, as I said. The third problem uh, that was just, uh, I believe it was just so solved this year, 2019. And again, this problem has been worked on for over 50 years. Uh, there are papers by Herb Simon and Dorothea Simon and others where what they tried to do was if I gave you a book in physics 
a random chapter, can you read the chapter and answer the questions at the end of the chapter? And any eighth grade student would be able to do that, hopefully. And they would answer maybe some number of those things. And this has proved to be very difficult. And the largest part of the problem was understanding language, algebra word problems and so on. So what they did early on, they said, we'll solve the problem of language later. Let us see if we can just solve the statement of the problem, or if we can formulate it in some formal. And so they converted the statement into post-productions as a production system. And then, given the goal, they were able to find a solution to the, each of the, about 11 out of the eight, 16 problems they were able to automatically solve at that time. And since then, a lot of people have spent a lot of time working on trying to solve this problem. Um, the Allen, Paul Allen, around um, 2001, I believe, 2002, 2003, uh, set up a whole project saying, can we have a computer take uh, biology exam, the AP, Advanced Placement Biology Exam of high schools, and uh, they spent like 10 years trying to solve that problem, $50 million plus, and didn't make much progress. Not that it was, they made a progress of different kind, and uh, I was on the review board, and you know, we said, you didn't, you're nowhere close, right? So what we said was, why don't you see, forget about biology AP, see if you can do eighth grade science. <laughs> uh, if you can't do that, go to fourth grade science. Do something where you can actually take the exam and pass it. And it turned out, uh, they gave the, took this exam, uh, they, they had a competition in 2016, and they were able to, um, uh, to take the exam, and the, the computer failed. That means it got less than a passing grade. And, th and then, over the last three years, they've been steadily making progress. And I'll show you the progress. Uh, so the, the idea here was to take a New York Region Science exam. It's kind of completely unknown, new test. And so, and the test, you have to take, the computer has to take the test and pass you know, the exam. And so, um, I'll show you. And so basically, over a period of three years, they have systematically been making progress. And uh, the biggest progress from 73 to 90% came by their models of understanding language. And uh, this problem of understanding language turns out to be very difficult. If you read the last line here, there, bank. You know, if I said to you, go to Deutsche Bank on the river bank, you know what the first word bank means and you know what the second word bank means, purely by context. And if I said, I'm banking on you to go to the Deutsche Bank on the river bank, now we have three. You know, so it turns out language is inherently ambiguous. And as a result, uh, they're, you know, you know, understanding what is intended and, uh, to, so that you can actually solve the problems becomes very difficult. And, uh, and this problem has been getting even harder with respect to deep learning, where they're trying to understand and translate from the language. And they have been in inventing uh, new models, uh, uh, language models, using uh, embedded language model, embeddings, um, so I won't go into the technologies they've used, but if you just used whatever is available on the web, like in a search engine, you're kind of getting like 58, 59%. If you want to get any beyond that, you need more sophisticated problem solving techniques. So anyway, this problem was just solved. And uh, so to me, uh, answering questions at the end of the chapter is partly solved, right? It's not yet 
Now, ultimately, what you want is I should be able to give you any textbook of eighth grade, including English textbook, and have you take the tests uh, that are in the, at the end of each chapter. And if the, if the computer can actually solve the, the same things uh, at, at, a, at some percentage level, it could be 80% or 90% of the problems you have to solve. And you might even have a time constraint, just like human students have a time constraint. They only have one hour or three hours of exam. And, uh, the, and, and so that, it, you have to kind of have metrics that are measurable for the, this to be a you know, successful grand challenge. So anyway, um, what I'd now like to do is spend uh, the next 10, 15 minutes to give you uh, the new list of the grand challenges and the motivations. The first two are any language to any language translation among the top 100 languages in speech to speech translation. So it turns out uh, we already have the technology. We know exactly what to do. If you go to uh, YouTube and type Trump speaking Chinese, You will, you'll see it, he will be speaking Chinese. And so the idea of taking Trump's speech in English, recognizing the speech, translating it into Chinese, and then synthesizing it, synthesizing it using the speaker specific models so that it would sound exactly like Trump. And that's where we are, we can do that at this point. But in order to do that, you need 100,000 hours of speech and 100 million words of text. And for most languages, we don't have that. And once we collect that data using the deep learning techniques, you can actually build the right models, which works at a very respectable level, right? And uh, so my grand challenge is take the 100 languages which are spoken by more than 10 million people each. And do the same thing for all the languages, where I can go from any language to any language. This has a major societal benefit. It's what I, one of what I call inclusive technology. It kind of empowers half the population of the world who now do not benefit from the advances of information technology. And it turns out If you do succeed, if you double the number of users of the internet, by network effect, you improve the economic activity of the globe, of the planet, by a factor of four. So there's also an economic reason for doing it. You would, instead of having a hundred trillion dollar economy, global economy, you would have four hundred trillion dollar economy by doubling. This is very important, okay? So anyway, that's, those are the first two. The third problem is, you know, we all do summarization. Summarization of books, summarization of music, movies. Or we don't always do those things. Summarization of books is, is something that's done. And uh, we seem to do it, you know, reasonably. The reason this becomes very important is we are entering an age, we have entered an age of information glut. All of us don't have enough time to read all the books. Every time I get a book with 300 pages, I say, what is the big idea? Tell me the big idea. I don't want to read the whole book. You know? and, and so I, if there is some way of producing, taking a 300 page book and producing a 20 page summary and two page summary and one paragraph summary, uh, what, is the, what is it that they're there? And people can do that. In fact, you know, Reader's Digest made a business out of it, right? So in, in some, some, some ways, this is also not just true for books. It's also for music. You know, I, I might go into a concert, which go, an opera which goes on for three hours. I'm not an opera buff. I can't uh, appreciate all of that. But I would like to hear maybe, you know, five minutes of it or ten minutes of it. Is there some way you can give me a gist of the, the opera, so I can listen to it and say, yeah, I understand why people go and spend three hours <laughs> on the stage, right? Especially coming from India, I had no clue what opera was, right? 
And uh, so the same is true for talks. You know, these talks go on for 45 minutes, an hour. And uh, if you listen to TED Talks, they said, no, you can't speak for 45 minutes. You can only speak for 18 minutes. That's the maximum. And there are other places where you go. And uh, the other day I was in China. They said, you, can, you know, you can't give a 15 minute talk. You can only speak for three, seven minutes. I said, I can't use slides. Then I just talked for seven minutes, whatever I could say. And that was it. You know? So it turns out, movies especially, I don't know how many of you do, do fast forward. I, I, I do that all the time because I don't have the patience to listen, see a movie for two hours. So I do a fast forward and listen for a minute and then fast forward and listen for a minute. <laughs> and we all do this and different people do it. And this is especially true for games, soccer, cricket, or football that go on for hours and hours. You want a summary of the most interesting highlights. Can you produce that automatically, right? And it can be done. People have been doing these things, but there has not been a systematic evaluation of how good it is and how well can we do it, what is the technology and, uh, needed, what is the science base that's needed, is not there. The other three are somewhat more uh, demanding, encyclopedia on demand. It turns out, you know, no matter what article there is on encyclopedia, as, you know, over a period of time, things change. And then you need a slightly updated version. You know, if you go to just do a Google search, you will simply get every newspaper article that was there, and you have to do the synthesis from there. But the idea that you can actually produce um, <clears throat> an encyclopedia on demand, where an intelligent agent would kind of look at all of the things and then produce it. The last two are motivated by space colonization problems, and space uh, exploitation, and, and a whole range of other things. Can you do remote repair on space? Something breaks down, can you, you, know, and can you send somebody down? In order to, do, so it's a, it's a hierarchy of problems. If you, the last problem is self-reproducing machinery. You can't uplift a whole factory into space. So what you want is machines that can make machines. So the idea of self-reproducing uh, factory, uh, you know, before you can do that, you need a self-repairing factory. Before you can do that, you need a self-diagnosing factory. At least you should say something is wrong, somebody has to come and fix it. Before that, you need self-monitoring fact. So there's a sequence of hierarchy of things that have to be done. We have studied this problem you know, at Robotics Institute for many years, and uh, it turns out it's a very hard problem. And whether it'll be done in, it may be done in your lifetime, you'll live for 150 years, so we'll see. Uh, then there are two other important uh, grand challenges, which I think have a, uh, will have a huge impact. Uh, right now, all, all the technology we have is mass uh, for everybody, one size fits all. In the future, the apps would be personalized. And so basically, as soon as you do that, all these concerns about privacy go away because only you and your, your intelligent assistant know what you're doing. Nobody else has access to the data not even Google and, and Amazon. And so the idea is to build a cognition amplifier which will help human beings to do more work in less time. Like can you do one, one day's work in one hour? Right? And the question is what is the architecture of such a system? And they have to be always on, always working, and always learning, enduring learning systems. There are no learning systems, not even deep learning now, that learn all the time, continuously update their models over a lifetime, right? And that's what we want to be working on. And uh, they, you know, for example, they should anticipate what you might want to do, paying a bill, right? And, um, and so, uh, so that's one class of intelligent assistants. The more interesting one is guardian angels, intelligent agents that do things that you cannot do. 
you don't know how to do. Not because you cannot do, because you don't have time. Your, your brain cells cannot handle, if I gave you all the information of everything that's happening all over the world at this instant, you cannot handle it. And Herb Simon called it, you know, uh, satisficing problem. Given a set of data, you, if your brain is not able to solve it, you use it, you find an, a subset of the thing, you don't try to optimize, you satisfy. And for that he got the Nobel Prize in economics, that people don't always behave rationally. Right? So anyway, uh, the guardian angel technology is to enable human beings to do tasks they cannot now do, leading to possibly superhuman AI. I don't think you should worry about superhuman AI saying that it's going to take over the world. All that it means is if you want to go faster, you built a car, you built a plane. These, you know, so that they're not taking over the world, they're just, you know, so you basically assume you will have uh, capabilities that your current brain cannot provide. And uh, I think one of the uh, uh, speakers uh, at the Found uh, uh, Laureate Forum this week used the word, the bicycle for the brain. So basically, yeah, you know, there are lots of things uh, that you may be able to do. Uh, and that was the definition I used early on, namely AI, it's like engineering. Engineering helps you to enhance the physical capabilities of the human being. AI helps you to enhance the mental capabilities of the human being. Anything you do that will make use me more power, you know, is, is because of AI. So basically, these are the two kinds of guardian angels I think we should <clears throat> be working towards. And with that, I just want to kind of simply say, grand challenge problems usually require major breakthroughs and fundamental advances in AI, and not AI only, you know, other areas of computer science and technology. Most of the advances in AI came in the last 10, 20 years is because we now have a billion times more computing power. Nothing to do with the idea. Ideas are the same. You know, many of the systems are still using hidden Markov models in speech that were invented in 1976, okay. So, in general, uh, and they are also adding a price and duration constraints leads to faster progress toward these goals. And these problems, almost all the problems I've presented are at least a 10 year horizon. It may be 10, 20, 50 years before we see the solution. Some of them may not be solved, not because they're not solvable, it is because nobody has decided to fund it in a large enough scale and John McCarthy used to say, uh, to get human level AI, we need uh, 1.7 Einsteins, three Maxwells, and 0.7 Manhattan Project. And uh, so we need all of those things. And if we can do that, I think we'll have a great, great future. Thank you. We have some time for questions, please. Can you bring a microphone? The microphone cube. So <laughs> you were speaking about summarizing text with AI, but doesn't that somehow require that there is an objective way to summarize the text? Yes. So basically, there are a lot of things we do, human beings do, where other people accept a good enough solution. There's no such thing as a, the correct summarization. There may be m many different ways of summarizing, many different words you might use, but the way to evaluate it is to have, just like you know, in Olympic, you have 10 judges, you throw away the high score and the low score and average the rest and see who gets the best score. Some such object, you have to ultimately create a, from a, go from a subjective measurement to an objective measurement so that you can actually um, measure progress. 
Thanks. Okay, thank you for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about a speech to pe speech to speech uh, translation, translation, yeah. and also uh, like machine translation. For what do you think? What are you planning to do for low resources languages? Because you say you want to focus for uh, on the ten like one hundred. Uh, most spoken languages. So um, we are facing challenges like some people in my country, I'm from Congo, and mm -hmm. we don't have translation in some of our languages where we have millions, thousands of people sp speaking those languages. So right. uh, do you have any uh, yeah. things so to say about So it turns out, you know, um, there are at least 3,000 spoken dialects that are spoken by a million people or more. We call them, many of them, orphan languages. And there are, uh, DARPA is actually funding some projects in, in, in orphan languages, Pashto and uh, Pashtun and various uh, other languages, because they are, sometimes find themselves, war fighters find themselves in that location. They need to understand it. So that there's a difference between, if you want to get to 95% human level accuracy, then you need the kind of data I talked about. But if you're willing to settle for 80%, by the way, 80% is pretty good, you know, if you're also able to kind of see and think and what, what is being said, uh, you, you know, you, you, all you, you can even do as simple translation as word by word translation of the sentence and let the human being figure it out. So there are lots of other partial solutions which would, can be also adopted. In fact, if you look at what Google did, Google Translate works very well. There are, all, I think, almost 100 languages text to text, but it's not perfect. It's nowhere close to perfect. Not even the kind of performance I'm asking about, but it's already usable. They're, they have released it. You know, if you can download an app, Google Translate, and it works, and, and it's amazing, you know. And so if you happen to be in another country and you can just speak or, tell, you know, or text, and it works. And so in that sense, uh, the solution to language translation problem should not be restricted to this. I try to be crisper. That's all I'm saying. Uh, for the 100 languages which are spoken by 20, 50 million people each, we need to pay attention to get as good a, a translation as we can. If you can do that, imagine, not only I can talk to you, but I can, for entertainment, I can listen to Gone with the Wind or Casablanca by putting my phone in front of the TV and I can listen to it in my local language. Yeah. And the same is true with respect to online shopping. If I'm illiterate and cannot read or write anything, I can still get the benefit of information technology. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Now we have probably to move on. <laughs> so let us thank the speaker again.